welcome to the next panel. The next panel is about authenticity. Quite a word, right? Quite a fashionable word, is it? Yesterday, a friend of mine, Ernst Pöppel, a brain scientist, came up to me and said, you know, Maria, what none of you mentioned, this conference is so different from, from all the conferences I'm going to, being a psychotherapist and neuroscientist, this conference is so full of authenticity. I mean, what is it, authenticity? Of course, we saw these, for instance, these wonderful ministers yesterday here on stage. They were really, I mean, the Malaysian one. I don't know, are you here? Where is she? I don't know, she was, I mean, she was hilarious. She was a treat because she was authentic. Obviously, she could touch us and she was straight to the heart. But what is it, being authentic? I mean, I don't know if you know this sentence when I talked to my girlfriend said, oh my God, I'm scared getting up on stage. She said, just be yourself, just be authentic. <laughs> to tell you the truth, this freaks me <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't help at all. <laughs> you know, I definitely, ha I have a picture or I have a very good idea of what I would like you to see when you look at me. You know, I have an idea. I would like you to see, you know, glamorous, good looking, intelligent woman. And of course, uh, you know, and this is a concept I have, but is this really the truth? I mean, the truth would be, you know, I'm scared standing here. There might be some sadness inside of me, but am I going to show this standing up in front of you? I mean, do, don't we have to hide a part of ourselves as soon as we get into public space? And how do we then manage or where is this part of us that is truthful and authentic? I don't know. I mean, there's some um, evidence that uh, we are sort of, there is maybe not such a thing as me or, a, you know, how, you, how would I say, a, yeah, determined Maria, because obviously brain science says we sort of redefined ourselves depending to whom we're talking to. I'm not the same one talking to my girlfriends, and I'm a different one when I talk to my daughter or to my son or to my husband. Um, and I sort of re I am different persons. So where in all this is the authentic person? Where is authenticity? And I'm very, very happy that we're having um, two, we're going to look at this issue from two different point of views. One from up down, which is like from the brain, from our psyche, is this the right word? Thanks to Susie Orbach. And from the other side, which is the embodied authenticity being in your body, which is certainly another way to find to your true self if there is such a thing. So first I want to welcome on stage my dear friend Susie Orbach from London. Hang on, Susie, I have to say something about you. You're getting some water, but don't go to pee again. Last time she went to pee and didn't come back for half an hour. <laughs> no, she's, she's close, so I can... But uh, Susie Orbach is a, a psychoanalyst from London. She has written many books. 11 books. She was here at DLD, our first DLD woman last year, and she spoke about her book Bodies. Uh, Bodies was about um, a very smart book, you all should read it, about the body hatred industry, which is uh, this industry that lives from the fact that we, mostly we women, have permanent problems with ourselves. You know these surveys where when you ask men, are you happy with yourself and with your body? 70% of the men say, yes, I think I'm like, you know, I think I'm cool and I look pretty good. And yeah, and with the women, it comes below 15%. 15% of us only think, yeah, I'm good the way I am. I mean, this is real trouble. Uh, and so you wrote this book, Bodies, where you really blamed the industry, the diet industry, the, sur the beauty industry, the surgical industry, to promote this kind of body hatred, and you found an organization organization called uh, enda Women Endangered Species, Endangered Bodies, and uh, well anyway, she's a wonderful woman, she wrote the book, uh, Fat is a f Feminist Issue, it's enough, it's enough, she said, okay, I'm always worried I'm not introducing well enough, so Susie, come up, you speak way better for yourself, come on, lovely Susie Orbach. <laughs> Thank you. 
Susie, welcome again. Thank you. Um, Susie, you, you told me that you were seeing more and more beautiful young women, accomplished women, best, you know, masters from Harvard, married with excellent jobs, and they come in your therapy, and they say, I, I don't know who I am. I just, I don't feel myself. How, how can you explain such a thing? Well, I, I, I think, is my mic on? Yes. Yes, no? Yes, 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 yes. okay. <laughs> I think that it's something that happened in, this la in, in, the, in the conversation between the two generations, really, that the mothers inadvertently foisted on their daughters the notion of achievement and accomplishment and happiness and being something. And that there's a kind of tyranny of choice that has happened with consumerism, where young women, and men, but specifically women, are supposed to tick every box of body, relationship, academic, kind, assertive, everything. And that in, inside of them, there's no place for the things that you just mentioned, which is vulnerability, um, confusion, complexity, uh, hesitation, fear. Because the whole mantra of that generation it has been, or what was given to them, I don't blame the generation, was be happy, be yourself, without the self having any space for unhappiness. So they only know themselves as a kind of construction, and they feel as themselves... A, as a view from outside, right? As, as a, a view that they... And they have their own eyes on themselves as, do I meet this view? And what happens when I'm unhappy? What happens... Not even unhappy. What happens when I don't know? What happens when there's a kind of spiritual deficit? What happens when I can't quite connect? When I'm not giving all the time? When I'm not performing? When I'm not in the moment of creation of self the whole time? When, when do we lose this, uh, this clear concept of me or this... G because if we look at babies, we're so attracted by it because they're, they're always whole. They're always fully there. They're only fully inside of them. Same thing uh, if we look at, at animals, right? We see them and we realize they're always totally themselves. When do we... We, not the animals. <laughs> when do we as humans lose this... This, yeah, this totally natural relationship to ourselves, to our bodies. Well, I probably would disagree with you because... How could you possibly dare disagree <laughs> with the chairwoman? <laughs> uh, with who? The chairwoman, Susie. <laughs> okay, the chair. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> what, what did you understand? <laughs> I think you have a very idealist... Can I be rude? I think Go you ahead, have an idealist on. view of infancy and of babies. I think you imagine that babies come in to some kind of neutral, benevolent world. I mean, no baby enters into neutrality. They enter into a family, to a parent's psych... If there are two parents, to the mother's psychology, to the father's psychology, to their economic situation, to their class, dare I say it, to their ethnic position, wherever they are. And from the minute of engagement with a baby, and I'm sure Lisa will uh, accord to this, everything about that baby is about inviting the child into that world. I mean, of course, the baby makes the mother too, but the mother introduces the child to the world. And every gesture and every engagement is about involving that child to be human in that society, right? I mean, we kiss, so, but... So, so what you say is that from the very first moment as a child depends on having you reacting to me as a correct. baby. Uh, if you I mean, I would say that. I'm a psychoanalyst, right? And so that from the very early stage, the baby would try to get a maximum reaction. A ma so that's what you mean when you say it's from the very early well, day. Well, in the early phases that what, what do babies want? Babies want, we know the human being has a basic need to connect and to survive. So they have an interest in capturing and captivating their mother or their caregiver. So they will do almost anything to charm you and find the ways that you, you will find charm. So 
if they if if you're a very expressive mother, they will probably be a very expressive baby. If you're a passive mother, they will be very calm. I mean, they will find their own development of their psychology in relation to that environment. And in that, certain aspects of self will not develop. Of course, we all have the potential to be many different things, but we won't develop those aspects that are not recognized, that are not acknowledged, that aren't seen, that aren't appreciated. And we may feel a certain shame and humiliation and embarrassment about the parts of us that we offer back to our parents that they can't, they can't find. Does that make sense? Oh, it definitely does. Do you, could you define something, a person that is authentic? Is there such a thing as a true self, an authentic self? Well, I think I would define an authentic self as I would take your position that you're on a platform, you're with your children, you're with your husband, you're with your friends. You may have different aspects of yourself, different self-states, but if, if you know yourself in all of them and they connect to each other, then I think that, and they're reliably there for you, that is a form of authenticity. If you have no idea how the hell you're going to be, and you require the stimulation of the other, then I think the authenticity is probably much more problematic. What do you do with uh, when such a young woman comes to you, and I'm w I would come to you saying, well, everything looks fine from the outside, but inside of me I feel totally decomposed and not myself. How do you work with them? Well, How do you try to get this sense of self and being a whole person, how do you try to get it back? Well, I think you've are, you're asking a very good question b because there's no formula. Uh, the one thing that's, that my job does is that it, it's really interested in the particular and unique thing of each person. So, first of all, I would be looking for words because once we have words, we can symbolize our experience. So, if, if you were the young woman and you said you feel chaotic and nothing inside, we would talk about that nothingness and we would find words for it and would hopefully in our engagement of my receiving, not rejecting that, you would feel there was a place for that inside of you which would, part, which would be part of the process of transformation for you and hopefully your breathing and your body and everything that is about you would be changing in that interaction. I can't really... I can't. Re I sound a bit mad now describing no, 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 it this way. No, not at all. Not at all. I think it's a very good. I think it's a very good answer to say to find a place for this nothingness, that this uh, this exists. You know, yes. this is a huge fear. And, and the finding the place doesn't mean it's frozen then, because it's also tra it it itself offers other things. So it might be sorrow that that wasn't allowed to exist and couldn't go in the place of nothingness, or it might be. Happiness. I mean, it could be all sorts of very subtle ways that we need to have an internal dialogue in order to have the building blocks to be a human being. Going back to, to uh, I know, eleven of your uh, six of your 11 books were on the topic bodies and, uh, and how do we see ourselves and this body hatred. Why do you think that we women are so much more uh, victims of this? Why well, so not for long. Not the men are catching up. I mean, there's far too much money to be made by, by creating body hatred and selling it around the world. And now, in the new economies, we are seeing the kinds of procedures that were sold to women being sold to men. And, and we already know that the pectoral, whatever it is for men, is being done, and leg extensions in China for men, and... Uh, 30, you know, under the, uh, in Iran, lots of the nose um, transformations are for men, they're not for women. But I think why we've historically needed is, unfortunately, in our early origins of the body, we have been surrounded by women who themselves have been subject to all the discomfort and distress. And so what girls absorb growing up is that the way to have a body is to be troubled. In other words, that's their experience. It's not their experiences that the way to have a body is to be, to have pleasure in it. It's, it's to be wary, to be careful, to be 
do the right sport, do the right food, do the right this. It's a body not to live from, but a body to, trans to do things to, almost like the body is a product. Uh, there is a, this um, survey about men that are going to the gym yeah. and you know, building up their body, and, and it's interesting because, of course, you would think those who go and who train their muscle, their pe pectoralis and so on, they're more and more happy with the body, but what happens the longer they go, the more they work, the unhappier they get with their bodies. So well, the one of the we things we're doing in uh, England in the campaigns around endangered bodies is we're working with the YMCA. I don't know if you... That's the big sports training organization. And we're trying to put components into the trainers' uh, education because we know most of them have body dysmorphias. They have body problems. And that they spend their lives working with people on the body as a form of trying to transform the bodies, but they're passing on very bad ideas about that the body is something needs to be disciplined, trained, you have to do this, you have to. So we're really trying to, at the level of education, question what is the gym about? It's not to say the gym can't be pleasurable, but what is it about? What is this, how can we engage with the hatred that is, un or the fear, or the, or the dislike of the appetite that the body building is trying to control. Does that make sense? It does. I have to say that uh, Susie was uh, the inspirer and you uh, organized this Dove campaign. You might have all seen it. You know this Dove campaign for when for the very first time there was a campaign with <laughs> normal women. <laughs> women that, you know, they were a little, little fat, a little this, and, and not reshaped because you blame so much that well, it we was don't see in publicity, we don't see one single normal picture, not photoshopped, not brushed, airbrushed Right, picture. but what was very interesting about that campaign, and because there's so many people from commerce here, is that it was very serious. It, before, before it came to market, we spent two years doing consciousness raising of everybody in the brand, and that was a thousand people to think about where their relationship to their bodies were, their daughters, their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, and to understand the complexity that you can't just say to women, go out and be beautiful. You need to do something more complicated, which is to show that the brand understood women's difficulties at this moment in history with being able to feel beautiful. So that the diversity pictures of women from 94 to 18 or with freckles or plump or were about, at, about women in their activities projecting this, but on the basis of the risk to dare to be okay, the risk to be beautiful. Because I think most, most of the ads play to, you're not beautiful enough, this way we'll make you beautiful. I mean, there we're coming back basically to the topic, what is beautiful? Is beautiful only this picture, this ideal picture we get in the ads or in the airbrushed world, let's call it like this, or is, is there a beauty of you being yourself? And now we're coming back. To authenticity. Sort of, to authenticity. Well and I wanted to ask you, Susie, is there any advice you could give us? Um, well how do we get... What do we find attractive? I mean, when we have a lover, or we're beginning a love affair, Okay? What are we interested in? We're not interested. Okay, the accomplishment, the polish, that's fantastic. We love that. But what we really want is the sense of the private, the, the vulnerable, the fears, the interest, the excitement, the things the person feels a little bit shy about. So that, to me, is a very crucial aspect of so why the hell aren't we showing that more? Yes, of course, when you're standing up here giving a talk, you don't say, look, I've had a row with this one and I'm a wreck. But when there is something, for example, drives me crazy in New York, when people say, you're buying, you're buying a dress or you're not buying a dress or you're buying a newspaper, and they say, have a great day, and I want to kill them. I don't want to have a great day. I want to have the day I'm having. I don't want to be interrupted. That's so true. That's so true. I had a kinder who would come every morning, and when she saw me, 
Liebe Paul, einen wunderschönen Tag heute. I already felt like, oh, miserable. I don't know if this is going... I know exactly what So mean, I'm always having a fight. I'm always think, can I have the day I want to have? Can I have an okay day? Would that be good enough for you? The poor shop attendants in New York. <laughs> when Susie comes, like, oh my Now God. Now it's happening in Paris. Bien journée. All the time. And it can be a friendly gesture too. It could be, but I prefer the English good day because it's kind of neutral. <laughs> All right. Well, do you have like to end this? Do you have like an advice you could give us women um, to feel more authentic, to feel happier inside of? It? By the way, happy with inside of ourselves. You told this lovely story when being in Brazil uh, at this psychoanalyst congress, huge congress, and they looked at you like like being from Mars or an insect or something because you were the only one there carrying, wearing your wrinkles age gave you. And it's like so, to them it's like you're, you're from another world. And it's, I mean, this well is, is going to be a So divide. is there an advice you can give Th us? It's I worse mean in New York now. When, I g when you go to New York, you don't know how old anybody is, really. And they look don't at the hand, and they usually. Don't tell they don't yes, look at the hand, but they don't tell you how old their children are because then you'll know how old they are. <laughs> of course. But to give advice, I don't. I think that y we all have a friend, or two, or three, or four, and it's about incorporating more aspects of the diverse dimensions of our personality. What the hell have we got to be afraid of? We go to the movies to feel pathos and pain. Why can't we feel it together? That's a really important. But also for women. How do we dare to feel our own success without feeling that we're too big, that we're too threatening, that something terrible is going to happen? I mean, these are very complex issues about, on the one hand, taking up the space we need in the world, and on the other hand, taking it up with the complexity of who we are. So I, if that's not too banal, that's what I would say. You can never be banal, Susie. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I call it